Welcome back to Under the Knife. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the dead house. The realities facing surgical students in earlier centuries were grim. Death was inescapable. In letters, diaries, and medical notes from the period, I always come across descriptions of putrid stenches emanating from what students called the dead house or the dissection room. Unlike the sterile laboratories of today, the dead house was a very different place. In 1793, James Williams, a 16-year-old student, described his living quarters next to John Hunter's anatomy school in a letter to his sister. My room has two beds in it, and in point of situation is not the most pleasant in the world. The dissecting room, with half a dozen dead bodies in it, is immediately above, and that in which Mr. Hunter makes preparations is the next adjoining to it, so that you may conceive it to be a little perfumed. There is a dead carcass just at this moment rumbling up the stairs, and the resurrection men swearing most terribly. I am informed this will be the case most mornings at about four o'clock throughout the winter. For the young man entering the dead house for the first time, the experience could be overwhelming. It was bloody, it was smelly, it had all kinds of insects and animals feasting on decomposing flesh. These bodies were in semi or advanced states of decomposition. A body begins to decompose immediately after death as cells and tissues begin to break down in a process known as autolysis. During this time, oxygen present in the body begins to deplete, creating an ideal environment for the proliferation of anaerobic organisms in the gut and respiratory organs. Eventually, the body begins to bloat and can cause ruptures in the skin as gases escape. As time passes, the body begins to digest itself and organs become liquefied. Dissection was a dirty business. Some medical students wore aprons to protect themselves from the fluids that were pouring out of these decomposing bodies, but a lot of them just wore their everyday clothes, and as a result, they carried with them the filth and the stench from their anatomical lessons. There were plenty of young men who entered training only to discover they could not endure the realities of the profession. In 1821, the French composer Hector Berlioz quit his surgical training, observing, it seemed to be the utter reversal of the natural conditions of my life, horrible and impossible. The poet John Keats similarly changed careers after spending too much time amongst putrefied bodies and the death rattles of the dying. As difficult as it was, students began to see the body not as human, but as anatomical specimens. Some of them became so detached that they were even able to cut into the bodies of relatives. In 1538, the French anatomist Guillaume Rondelet publicly dissected his infant son before hundreds of spectators. And in the 17th century, William Harvey dissected both his sister and his father. Learning from the dead was not just unpleasant, it was dangerous. As bodies begin to decompose, infectious organisms multiply. In 1788, a young medical student cut his finger while dissecting the dead body of a child. A few hours later, he began suffering from terrible headaches and later started hemorrhaging. By the next day, he was dead. His name, Charles Darwin, was later given to a nephew who went on to make it famous. This would be the fate of many surgical students in the 18th and 19th centuries. The dangers were hardly a deterrent for young men wanting to enter the profession. Surgery grew in popularity, and with it, more bodies were needed. Lots of them. By the beginning of the 19th century, the body trade was booming. Resurrection men, or body snatchers, could demand as much as 10 guineas or £10.50 per corpse. Put into context, the weekly wage of a master tailor or carpenter during this period was approximately 30 shillings or £1.50, whereas an East End silk weaver working 12 hours a day might only earn 5 to 10 shillings a week, or 50 pence. For those with the strength and the cunning, body snatching could be a lucrative business. For medical students and surgeons who benefited from the thievery, it was a necessary evil. But that's a subject for a different day. Enough with the smoke! 